Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who sends the world with angels, who made flesh among all peoples, and who breathes peace on all the earth. Amen. In Christ, we are bold to name our sin and cry out for peace. Holy God, we confess our sin before you. We replace compassion with competition. We seek what is mighty while ignoring the meek. We are quick to anger, but slow to forgive. We have not put on love in harmony with you. Wrap us in the grace of your powerful word. Swaddle our hearts with your peace that all we do in word or deed may reflect your love born among us. Amen. I bring you good news of great joy for all people. God has come among us in the child born of Mary, Christ the Lord. In Christ, your sins are forgiven and you are clothed in peace. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you.
ever-living God. Increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Jeremiah. And now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, good Lord! Truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy. For you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from 1 Corinthians. If I speak in tongues of mortals and angels, but I do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. And as for tongues, they will cease. And as for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete ones, the partial Will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully. But even as I have been fully known, and now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. The greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus began to say to all in the synagogue in Nazareth, 
Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zephareth in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So the last line of last week's gospel text is the first line of this week's. So this is a continuation of the story. And in this text, we're going to find out what the people's true reaction to Jesus stating that he is the fulfillment of scripture, that he is here to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives, give recovery of sight to the blind, let the oppressed go free. Last week we read and heard that Jesus was praised by everyone and that the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then this week we find out that he was being praised before he spoke and we found out why all the eyes in the synagogue were indeed fixed on him. I mean, first they did not believe that Jesus could be the Messiah. After all, isn't he just Joseph's son, they thought? They said, we knew Jesus as a bumbling teenager. We saw him make mistakes. And now he is here to tell us that he is a prophet and that he is in not fact Joseph's son, but the son of God. Now that's just crazy. And then Jesus' response to them is that a prophet is never welcomed in his or her hometown. And he gives two examples of how Elijah and Elisha were not able to perform miracles in their own hometowns and had to leave in order to do any work. So this comment upsets the people and they got angry at Jesus. These people are regular attendees of the synagogue. They're waiting for the coming of the Messiah and they are faithful people. But then they hear the word of God from Jesus himself, and they don't like what he has to say. I mean, he isn't talking about them. He's talking about the blind, the poor, the widow, and the oppressed. And they expect the Messiah to be something different. They expected the Messiah to come and speak a message tailored to them. They expected the Messiah to fit in with their agenda and to fit in with them. But Jesus was giving them more than that. He was giving them a shot at eternal greatness and a glimpse of glory. He was offering them a mission greater than themselves and larger than their own petty squabbles. He was giving them a chance to ascribe to the timeless and become a part of something much bigger than they could ever imagine. He was giving them a chance to be anointed, set apart for holy work. They had the opportunity to preach the gospel to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners, to give sight to the blind, and to set free the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Jubilee. But they didn't want to go there with Jesus. They wanted him to fit in with their agenda, and they sure did not want to follow his. So instead of striving to attain God's great commission, they wanted God to dwell in their small-mindedness. They don't want to become more like Jesus. 
They wanted Jesus to become more like them. So the question hits close to home. Are we ready to step up to Christ's mission? Or are we trying to make him fit into ours? In most churches today, the mission of Jesus isn't even a listed objective in their mission statement sometimes. We just do not measure our faithfulness by what Jesus said on the very said is the very reason he was anointed. And we wonder what we can do, how we can bring people into the congregation. How do we change programming that will bring in the most people from the neighborhood that would fit into the mold we feel most comfortable with? There's no talk about what is the message of Christ expecting from us. What is the word of God saying to us? How is the Holy Spirit guiding us through the process? And if we go at this alone, that is where we are going to end up. Many of us have heard the scripture preached at least once every three years, and yet we still left church without altering our lives one iota. We all love Jesus. But we, just like the people that gathered in the synagogue on that morning when Jesus read from the scripture, we too don't buy into his agenda and we rather follow our own. When we hear a message we don't like, we usually ignore it or we try to reinterpret it. So we say, well, maybe Jesus means for us to preach to the spiritually poor or to the faithless blind. We don't want to hear it so that it challenges us in our heart. We don't want to hear a message that might make us ask to change the way that we do things. Lutheran theology says that Jesus comes to us, that there is nothing we have to do in order for Jesus to love us and be our savior, that we are saved by grace. And with this statement, you might think, so since Jesus comes to us and we don't have to do anything because of grace, Jesus should not ask anything of us. After all, Lutherans don't believe in self-righteousness. And yes, that, that is true, but there's something that is missing if you're just going to rely on grace alone and not expect the message of Christ to challenge and to change. Because something happens when we read the Bible. Something happens when we pray. Something happens when we are part of a Christ-centered community. Something happens when we truly listen to the message of Christ. We are asked to change. We are challenged. We are told to stop living in our old skin, to stop living our old ways, to stop trying to be in control and let it all go in order to follow Christ, to find out exactly what it is that Christ has in store for us. So this month, you know, it's been a COVID spike and we've been spending a lot more time at home. And one of the days we, uh, well, we, we rebooked our Disney vacation for the third time. I'm really hoping that we get to go this year. Um, and we just kind of every once in a while decide that we're going to watch a Disney movie to get ready for it, right? So this week we watched Encanto, which is super cute. And you guys should go out and, or you guys should see it. Um, it's on Disney Plus, but Encanto is the new, the new cartoon. And oh, I just love it. Um, but we also watched Up. It's the older Pixar movie. Um, and I don't know how many of you watch animated movies, but Up is quite wonderful. The movie is about two kids that love adventure and the two kids fall in love and they get married. And as a young married couple, they have dreams of traveling the world and especially visiting a place called Paradise Falls. They save money, but life happens. We know that. For them, it was the car breaking down or something breaks in the house before they knew it. They were an elderly couple and the wife Ellie is sick. 
and Ellie dies before they ever get the chance to visit Paradise Falls. And a few years later, when the husband, Mr. Carl, is being forced to go to a retirement community, he decided to take one last adventure, or maybe his first, really. But he decides to travel to Paradise Falls. Now, he doesn't just pick a bag and buy a plane ticket. He wants to go there with Ellie. So he ties thousands of balloons to his house, and he takes his house on the journey to Paradise Falls. And on the way, he discovers that a Boy Scout hitched a ride by kind of like sitting on his porch. And later, a talking dog and a giant bird begin to follow them on this tunnel vision journey. I mean, Mr. Carl is so focused on getting this house to the edge of the falls, he's willing to let the giant bird be captured, to let the Boy Scout run off in the jungle by himself. And he is very mean to this talking dog. All he can focus on is his house and all the stuff in his house. Now, Mr. Carl has the house tied around his waist and he is literally walking the house across an island so he can set it next to a waterfall. I mean, talk about carrying your baggage. After all his travel partners have left him and he has the house in the exact right position next to the falls and he is sitting in his chair next to Ellie's empty chair, he thinks his life is complete. He is surrounded by his stuff. He has his memories of his wife and he fulfilled their dream of having a grand adventure and having a home next to the falls. But it only takes a few moments to realize that this is not exactly what he had in mind. He was not supposed to do this alone, without Ellie. And now he really is alone. He has his stuff, he has his memories, but really what else does he have? So he decides to go after the bird, the dog, and the Boy Scout. He tries to let the balloons up again, but realizes that there is no longer enough air to let left in them to lift the house because there is so much baggage that he is still carrying. So he goes around the house and he throws everything out. He gets rid of the two chairs, the books, the fridge, Anything that is not bolted into place, he leaves behind. And then eventually the house floats again. He is no longer has the house tied around his waist, but he is using the house as a tool, as an asset. And in the end, he gets the Boy Scout and the dog, and they return the bird back to her family, and they head back home. But this time, without the house without the baggage. And in fact, he just lets the house fall to the ground and the house gets to where it needs to go. It ends up next to that waterfall, but it is not put there by him. And then Mr. Carl goes back to his life, but it is a life much more full. He has friends and he's involved in the neighborhood. He let go of the past and the baggage and he gained something that he wasn't even looking for and could never imagine he would have again. He has friendship and love. And I have this idea that the church is going through a re revitalization process. That we as a church body, the larger church body, that we are starting to move towards something different. And we have to because the current system is no longer working. COVID has pulled all of that back and we are seeing the brokenness. Our model of standalone congregations with a full-time pastor and a full staff is no longer realistic for most congregations. My first call closed, my second one, voted to sell their building. And my last call, 
They were in the process of downsizing their staff when I was there. And this is no one's fault. No congregation is to blame. It's the model that is no longer working. And we don't quite know what is next. But you know, it'll probably, it will not include each congregation having its own building and its own pastor. Things are gonna be different. It'll probably be smaller worshiping communities sharing resources in order to do more outreach and less maintenance. It'll mean that we will have to let the buildings we have tied around our waist go. That we will need to let go of some baggage that we carry about the way the church is supposed to be and become part of the communities that surround us. And this image of mine is not an easy one to follow or to connect with because we are all prone to be like Mr. Carl and tie our belongings of comfort, the current way that we like to do things, the comfortableness of our surroundings. We want to tie all of that around our waist and let it lead us instead of letting the message lead us. And there are days that you are going to think that the message is asking too much and you are just going to want to hurl it off the edge of a cliff like the people in the gospel wanted to do with Jesus. And then the gospel tells us that the people didn't even get the chance to chase him off the cliff because Jesus just slipped right out the back door. And we wonder at this event if it's Jesus' movement through the crowd were miraculous or dramatic, but yet the truth is that it happens every week in churches. The words of Jesus are there. The potential for greatness is there. Even the resources are there for the most part. But Jesus himself slips right out the back door because people become too self-focused, too theologically focused, are too building focused, and honestly, we are too power focused. We take firm stands on the color of the carpet for the fellowship hall. We argue over what hymns to sing Sunday morning. I've had congregations argue over if they should order styrofoam or paper cups, but really, that doesn't have any of this, any of it. What does it have to do with bringing forth the kingdom of God? Are these the issues Jesus is challenging us with? Jesus was right there, but he slipped out when he saw that the church folk of Nazareth were going to spend the rest of their lives debating who he really was and what Jesus really meant. And Jesus didn't have to sneak out. He could have yelled, here I am, come and get me, all the way down the road to Carpanium. And they still wouldn't have noticed. They were too busy with their personal stuff. They were focusing on the house tied around their waist instead of the possibility for more that was right in front of them. How horrible, how sorrowful. Jesus was right there and he walked away with a ho-hum and an uncovered yawn, essentially. I mean, Jesus slipped right out of the back of their church. And let us strive not to make Jesus and Jesus' message for us and us alone. Let us not lose our Savior in the need for comfort and fearful of the unknown. Let us not accept, accept that Jesus will ask us to remain the same and expect the message of Christ to conform to us. Instead, let us risk losing it all for a God who has given it all. Let us abandon ourselves to a mission worthy of our greatest effort the mission of Christ himself. 
and let us trust that there is something much greater to be gained once we untie the house from our waist, once we throw out all the baggage and we let the message lead us when we let Christ take the lead. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. Guide your church in the ways of faith, hope, and love. Cultivate ministries and communities of compassion that bear witness to your enduring presence among us. God of grace, hear our prayer. Teach us to live in humility on the earth. Curb arrogance that leads to destruction of natural resources and disregard for future generations. Inspire the work of scientists who urge us to live in harmony with your creation. God of grace, hear our prayer. You are the refuge of all who seek hope and freedom. Accompany immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers who cross borders to find safety and opportunity. Embolden leaders to draft compassionate policies on behalf of migrants and those who assist them. God of grace, hear our prayer. Love bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things. Comfort with your love all who are lonely, fearful, or brokenhearted. Sustain the hope of all who suffer in body or spirit. God of grace hear our prayer. Your grace falls upon young and old alike. Bless the gifts of children in this congregation and in this community. Give us humble hearts to follow their leadership. Inspire us with their laughter, their insight, and their curiosity. God of grace, hear our prayer. We praise you for those who have gone before us and now see you face to face. Abide with us this mortal life until we rest in the arms of your never-ending love. God of grace, hear our prayer. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all our prayers to you in confidence and faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. God, we pray for those in our community and around the world who need to feel your love. Today we pray for the 882,000 lives lost to COVID-19 in the United States and the 5.65 million lives lost worldwide. We also pray for those in our community, including Bonnie, Marion, David and Anne, Helen, Elsie, 
Irv, Sandra, Katie, Frank, Nancy and Bob, the Dupree family, Everly, Linda, and Ruth. We lift up doctors, nurses, first responders, and all of those who are feeling burnout. Lord, if, Lord in your mercy, hear our prayer. The peace of Christ be with you always, and also with you. Please share a sign of peace with one another. Let us pray. Good and loving God, we rejoice in the birth of Jesus who came among the poor to bring the riches of your grace. As you have blessed us with your gifts, let them be blessings for others. With the trees of the field, with all the earth and heaven, we shout for joy at the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. In the wonder and mystery of the Word made flesh, you have opened the eyes of faith to a new and radiant vision of your glory, that beholding the God made visible, we may be drawn to love the God whom we cannot see. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. beginning and the end, the giver of life. Blessed are you for the birth of creation. Blessed are you in the darkness and in the light. Blessed are you for the promise to your people. Blessed are you in the prophet's hopes and dreams. Blessed are you for Mary's openness to your will. Blessed are you for your son Jesus, the word made flesh. In the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith together. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. With this bread and cup, we remember your word dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. We remember our new birth in his death and resurrection. We look with hope for his coming. 
Come, Lord Jesus. Holy God, we long for your spirit. Come among us, bless this meal. May your word take flesh in us. Awaken your people, fill us with your life. Bring the gift of peace on earth. Come, Holy Spirit. All praise and glory are yours, Holy One of Israel, Word of God incarnate, power of the Most High, one God now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In Christ's manger, at Christ's table, come see what God makes known for you. Amen. The body of Christ given for you the blood of Christ shed for you.
Let us pray. Radiant God, with our eyes we have seen your salvation, and in this meal we have feasted on your grace. May your word take flesh in us, that we may be your holy people, revealing your glory made known to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Receive the blessing. The God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing so that we may abound in hope. By the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. Amen. Christ our Savior. Thanks be to God.